Well, good morning, dear saints of God. Um, come at your prayers just with all the smoke and asthma. I'll see if I can get through to the second sermon this morning. But I want to welcome anyone visiting. Glad you're with us. And live stream anyone with us there. We are grateful to have you. So as a church, we're studying through the book of Romans. If you want to turn there, we're going to be in chapter 4. Last time we were together in Romans, we finished up Romans chapter 3, and then we pulled out and Ray preached on unity. And last week we looked at Hebrews 10, that here we have no lasting city. So we will look this morning, uh, begin laboring again in the Word of God uh, back in Romans chapter 4. So may He grant us grace and believing the truth we're going to look at. This chapter, Romans chapter 4, has been called the Logizomai chapter. And that's the Greek word that, that means imputation, to credit to someone's account. This word is used 39 times in the New Testament, and almost a third of its uses are in the chapter that's before us this morning. So my prayer is that Logizomai would not just be a Greek word, uh, or a theological term, but that it would overtake our minds and our hearts and that we would be blessed in believing as we understand this beautiful truth that God has done. So I'm a minister for your joy this morning and you believing this glorious gospel. So let's pray and ask him to meet us here in Romans chapter 4. Father, I thank you for the book of Romans. I thank you for what it's done throughout the history of the world. And God, I pray that it would do that in our hearts this morning. Lord, I know there'll be some who will hear my voice that have never, ever surrendered to Jesus Christ. They've lived in the church and they've been moral their whole life, but they've never come to surrender to what we're going to look at this morning. And so I pray that you would work deep in hearts. And I pray that the believers, that our hearts would soar with the grace of God, that you would credit righteousness to our account. God, meet us. Let this now be a time of worship together. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Romans chapter 4, I just want to kind of briefly review again and set the context. Chapters 1 through 3 is the, the Paul showing us that we are all under his condemnation, whether we are moral or immoral, whether we've grown up in the church or outside, we, we are all under condemnation, Jew or Gentile. The, the wrath of God is upon us for sin, our own sin, the sin of Adam, and we inherit that. And so we come in in this place where we can't get out. There's nothing within us that can get out of that place. And so we were journeying and we came to Romans 3.21, but now God has done something in Christ to rescue us from that. And it's a perfect salvation. It's sufficient. Christ has come and obeyed. We learned He redeemed us from, from our, our bondage. He propitiated the wrath of God off of us, and we are now vindicated. We're justified. We stand not guilty before God. A, a, cry, a God kind of righteousness has been put to our account. So as the Reformer said, you're saved by grace alone through Christ alone, who's come and done the work, and you receive it by faith alone. Free sovereign grace is what we've been studying. And so now we're going to turn our attention in chapter 4. And what I want to do is I want to begin this morning by giving you a flyover of what chapter 4 is about, and then we'll dig into the trees. So look with me in Romans 3.27, the last time we were together. Paul said, where then is boasting? It's excluded. In this gospel, no one boasts, but in Jesus Christ alone. By what kind of law of works? No, but by a law of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since indeed God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith is one. Do we then nullify the law through faith? May it never be. On the contrary, we establish the law of God. We lift it up and show its fulfillment in Christ. So uh, Romans 3, 27 through 31, Paul is now going to flush out in detail in chapter 4. And in chapter 4, verses 1 through 8, he's going to deal with verse 27, and he's going to show that there's no boasting. Abraham cannot boast. Uh, he didn't keep the law to be saved. So it's no boasting. Verses 9 through 12, now we're going to deal with 3, 29 through 30. And that's that the Jew and Gentile, anyone who believes, will be justified. So Abraham is the father of faith for Jew and Gentile. 
verses 13 through 16, Paul's going to deal with the fulfillment of the law, which was verse 31 of chapter 3. And then in verses 17 through 22, he's going to teach us the nature and the character of faith by the example of Abraham. And then he'll close out and make application in verses 23 through 25. And I'm going to ask you to turn to that because I don't want us to miss what Paul's doing in this chapter. In verse 23, now not for his sake, Abraham's only, was it written that it was credited to him as righteousness, but for our sake also, to whom it will be credited as those who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He who was delivered over because of our transgressions and was raised because of our justification. And so I don't want you to miss this. Abraham lived 4,000 years ago. And this is not just to be a nice Bible story this morning. This is the truth of his faith, the faith that saved Abraham. And it's the truth for all of us today. He said, I write this for you who would believe in Jesus today, that you would be justified. So it's written for every one of us in this room, and some of you are sitting here right now, and you need to be justified. So don't let this just be a, a, a chapter like a historical lesson. This is relevant to you and me this day. This is God's truth of how he saves sinners right up until the present. It, it abides from generation to generation to generation. We're living in a crazy time. I've never seen anything like this in my lifetime. It just feels like the whole world's gone mad. And I want you to hear this this morning. In the middle of it all, God's truth abideth still. This salvation does not change. 4,000 years ago, same this morning. Romans 4 is for us today. A God kind of righteousness will be credited to your account if you believe today. If you believe this gospel, it'll be credited to your account. Right in your account, the ledger of Ken Murphy can be made full by this gospel. In Philippians 3, Paul said, my, my ledger was full of manure. The Greek word for loss is manure. All I had in my righteousness account after everything I tried and worked to be religious and moral and good and keep the law was manure. And this morning, God's saying, I will actually take the righteousness of Jesus Christ and impute it to your account. I'll give you that righteousness that has manure in it this morning. And so what is Paul doing in this chapter? I just want a little overview. In the Old Testament, you got three characters that stand head and shoulders above the rest. You got Abraham, the father of the nation that God called out and he made a covenant with him. You got Moses who gave the law and he led them out of a 400-year bondage of slavery. And you got David, the shepherd king who defeated their enemies and established the kingdom. And Paul's going to bring all three of those in this chapter, uh, chapter 4. Why? Paul's just laid out the glorious gospel that we received from God, that he received from God in verse 1 and 2. He's now going to take on the Jewish antagonist who's going to say, what is this gospel? Are you just throwing out our whole history of Moses and David and Abraham? Is it just gone? And Paul's going to show us the most beautiful truth in this chapter. But this gospel is how God has always saved sinners. I want you to get this. God has saved sinners the same way through all of history since Adam sinned. It's not a new gospel. It's fuller. It's colored out. But God has not changed. I'll prove to you from the heroes of the, that your history is what Paul's going to say. It's always been through grace alone, through faith alone, has always been God's message and his design. And so Romans 3, 21 through 31, you're saved by grace through what Christ has come and done on this earth by faith alone. It's not new. Go back to Romans 1, 2. There's a gospel he was set apart for, which he promised beforehand through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures. Romans 1, 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, also to the Greek for in this gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, just as it is written, the righteous man shall live by faith, as he quotes Habakkuk 2.4. And then in Romans 3.21, but now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, 
being witnessed by the law and the prophets. The law and the prophets have witnessed and told us of this gospel that we're going to look at this morning. And so I want you to see that this is not a new religion. This is not a new message. It's fulfillment of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. Abraham said, he longed to see my day, Jesus. Jesus said, if you believe Moses, believe me because Moses spoke of me. And so my first witness that Paul's going to call forward is Abraham, the father of Judaism, and, and listen to this, the father of faith. So what do you think would be, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> we're going to get through this. <clears throat> <clears throat> what would be a Jew's first thought to what he would have just heard then? And he would have said, Abraham, Abraham obeyed God. He came out, he offered up Isaac, he was justified by what he did. And I just want to give you a little history of of how the Jews thought about Abraham when Paul's writing this. In the Jewish apocryphal books, they taught that Abraham was justified by keeping God's law. In Ecclesiasticus 44, 19 through 21, it says that Abraham's obedience made him right with God. The prayer of Manasseh said Abraham did not sin. In the book of Jubilees, it said that Abraham was perfect in all of his deeds. And so Abraham was the stalwart that was held up. You want to talk about getting saved by works? It's Abraham. By using Abraham, now Paul is storming the very citadel of of traditional Judaism. And so what's going on in chapter 4 is big. And so as we jump in, I just want you to look at one last thing. I want you to look at the bookend of chapter 4. Look with me at uh, Romans 4.3. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And then I want you to flip over to 422. Therefore, for Abraham, it was credited to him as righteousness. And so we're just kind of bookended in this whole chapter of what Paul wants you to see is that Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And that's what we're going to dig in this morning. And I pray that God will work and plow in every one of our minds and hearts. I I just feel led to pray again. Father, the heart looks out and just sees some cold faces, some faces that this truth doesn't make their heart alive. And so God, would you come and meet us now as we open this word and labor in it? Would your spirit speak into every mind and heart the amazing glory and beauty of what is before us in this text. God, come plow and do your work, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I just fight dead religion. This morning, our outline is we're going to look at three aspects of Abraham's righteousness. In verses 1 through 3, we're going to look at the imputation. In verses 4 through 5, he's going to now clarify it. And then in verses 6 through 8, he's going to prove it with David. And as much as I tried, I just couldn't get that done. So next week, we're going to look at David in verses 6 through 8. So just two points in our outlines this morning. So the first aspect of Abraham's righteousness we're going to look at is imputation. And I want you to begin with me then in verse 1. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, has found. What should we say? What did Abraham find? What did he, what is his experience with how he got right with God? What did Abraham learn? How did he get this relationship with Almighty God? And so I just want to look at Abraham, the father of the Jewish people. In Genesis 17, 5, God said, no longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall now be Abraham, for I will make you the father of a multitude of nations, Abraham, fatherless Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, the New Testament begins the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David and the son of Abraham, the, the fulfillment of those two characters. So if Paul can show that Abraham is the father of the faithful and that he came into a right relationship with God by faith and not by any good works, he's got them. The argument's won. Paul's whole case is won or lost right here. So in verses 1 through 2, there's nothing according to the flesh that is good in Abraham. There's nothing that could have ever commended him before God by his doing. It was not his obedience that gave him favor with God. There was nothing in Abraham that he did that got him a right standing with God. And so the the Greek translation would be this. What did Abraham find to be the case 
so far as his own human ability was concerned? And the answer was, Abraham, what did he find? He needed grace. He needed the gospel that we are looking at this morning and that we live in. God did not look down on the earth And see, there's only one faithful man on all the earth, Abraham. I might be able to do something with him. In Genesis 6, 5, it said that God looked down on the earth and he only saw that every thought of man was only evil continually. In Romans 3, 10, there is none righteous, not even one. There's none who understands. There's none who seeks for God. All have turned aside and together they've become as rotten fruit. So as God looks out, there's, there's nothing in Abraham. There's a man who hates God. His, his heart's only evil continually. We're told he was a worshiper of the stars. So in verse 2, what if, what if he was justified by works? Then he might have something to boast about. In the Greek, this is called a second-class condition. It's a condition of unreality. It's assumed as true for the sake of argument, though it isn't really true. So we know that he wasn't justified by works, but let's just assume that. And so was he justified? The the Greek is ek ergon, which means out of works. So if you look at a circle, ek is to come out of it. So did Abraham, out out of him, did works come out of him to get him right with God? And the answer is no. And if it did, he could boast before men. But he would never be able to boast before God. And what has been this whole gospel that we've been laboring in? that no one would ever be able to boast before God with anything they've ever done. They could only boast in the cross of Jesus Christ. Abraham can make no boast before God. And I pray that anyone this morning, you can make no boast before God for your acceptance. Don't ever say, I deserve your salvation based on something I've done. I pray that every one of us are stripped naked before God and we have no boast before him. And where I really want to park this morning is how was Abraham saved then? What, what, what can he boast in? Let, let's take a look at this and try to understand it. So come with me to verse 3. And verse 3 says, what does the scriptures say? I love that. What do the scriptures say? That is the only thing that matters this morning. What does the scripture say about our salvation I don't care what anybody else says. I don't care what any teacher or preacher, council, tradition, catechism, or or pastor, I I do not care what anyone else says. (laughs) What does Scripture say? What a great place to start. What do the Scriptures say about how I can be right with God? And this is what, what killed many in Paul's day. They had the Scriptures. They had them and they began looking at man-made rules and traditions and they twisted things and slanted to where they ended up believing that Abraham was justified by works. And they have the same scripture that we're looking at this morning. Abraham believed God and it was credited as righteousness. What do the scriptures say? Don't get away from them. Don't drift. Don't let false teachers lead you away from what do the scriptures say? I read an article this week that 70% of professing Christians in America believe that you get right with God by things that you do. A booksellers convention a long time ago in Anaheim, they went around interviewing everybody and saying, what is justification by faith in Christ alone? And I listened to answer after answer. And they said 2% could answer what is justification by faith in Christ alone. We've lost what the whole Reformation was built on and and this whole gospel that we'll look at this morning. What are you basing your salvation on? What do the scriptures say? And I want you to hear this. Your soul is eternal and your soul is going to live forever. It's going to live forever. And are you going to base your eternity on what man says or, or worse off on what you think? or what sounds good, or what you think is fair? Will you base your eternity on anything else besides what does Scripture say? What does God say about salvation? So I pray that you would throw down anything else, but what does God say on such an important thing as to where you will spend all of eternity? And you can say, I don't don't care. And this morning I'm asking you to care about a soul that lives forever. In one or two places, in eternal heaven or eternal hell. The two are as extreme opposites as possible. And I would that everyone 
would be saved from the wrath to come. By what does Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. That's your memory verse. I pray that every little kid in our church, and even adults, would memorize such a simple verse. Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. That's what we're going to look at this morning. So Paul's quoting from Genesis 15, 6. When God quoted this, when, when, when he first came to Abraham and told him in, in uh, Genesis 12, at age 75, he made a promise to Abraham. And he said, Abraham, all the nations are going to be blessed by your seed. And it seems somewhat out of reach when you're 75 and the years start to go by and they just keep moving and no child. He's not getting any younger, nor is his wife. So Abraham, what should I do? In Genesis 15, where our verse is taken from, I want to read it to you. In verse 1, <clears throat> after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, do not fear, Abram, I'm a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. And Abram said, O Lord God, what will thou give me since I'm childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, since thou has given no offspring, offspring to me, one born in my house is my heir. He kind of, hey, God, since you haven't given me children, how about this one that was born of my offspring? Then behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, this man will not be your heir, but one who shall come forth from your own body, he shall be your heir. And he took him outside and said, look to the heavens and count the stars. And if you're able to count them, and he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And then he believed in the Lord, Yahweh, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. And so I don't want you to let this get by you. He's 85 years old at that point. And God says something to Abraham that he could never do by himself. It would be impossible for him to conceive a child. And it would be something like keep the law in order to be right with God. It would be impossible. No one could ever keep it. And God said, I will do it, Abraham. I'm going to be the fulfillment of this promise to bless you through a seed. And it can only come by me and me alone and me fulfilling this promise. And, and Abraham can add nothing. He can bring nothing. He can accomplish nothing. He comes up with no plan to help God. He doesn't give him a little help. How about me and you working together? It's a promise that has to be God and God alone to accomplish it. It must be done by God. And Abraham, what does he do? He believes God. He's, he's done looking to his own hands and his own ideas. And he finally just believes God. He took God at his word. Have you? That's the simple application. Have you taken God at his word like Abraham? I will bless you through the seed if you believe. That's the message of the gospel. And he believed, and it was credited to him as righteousness. We weep at that. He got something better than children. He was given a right standing with God and an eternal relationship with him. This is major. This is the first time that justification by faith is set forth in the Bible. Faith. Righteousness and justification right here. Reckoned in the Hebrew, hasa, and in the logizomai, in the Greek. It's a bookkeeping term from accounting, and it's, a, it's an actual transaction, and it means to, to put to someone's ledger, to credit it to their account. It literally means to impute. So what is this saying? In our account, born of Adam, we're bankrupt with righteousness. There's none righteous, not even one. Our righteous acts are like a filthy rag. So in every one of our accounts, it's filthy. It's manure. It's nothing. And by grace, God puts the righteousness of Jesus Christ to your account. Puts his own righteousness into your account. He makes a divine deposit. And so that now we're given the storehouse of righteousness and we measure up to God for all that he requires of us. It's fulfilled in Christ. And now God looks at us as if we live the life that Jesus Christ lived. That is what we call grace. I love logizomai. It's the only way I've ever found peace for my conscience. 
Genesis 15, 6, he believed in the Lord and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. God took Christ's righteousness and wrote it into Adam's ledger. And that's why we sing amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And so what I want to try to park on and then we'll close out is what did Abraham believe? I just, that matters to me. Like, what, what did Abraham believe? Because I think this is going to open up the, the Bible and, and the whole thing is, what did he believe? The text doesn't say, because I had people, all you have to do is just believe that, that God said something, you know, and, and you're saved. And, and I want to show you that what we're studying, and this is the way God has always saved sinners. So what did he believe? The text doesn't tell us all the way. We're just told that the ultimate object of his faith was God. And we're left in the dark to the very specific content. And I'll I'll just help reveal then what we do know. And in Genesis 12, I want to read it to you. The Lord said to Abram, go forth from your country, go out. And from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you. And I'll make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And the ones who curse you, I will curse. And in you, the families of the earth shall be blessed. The nations. And then in Genesis 15, I've already read uh, the rest of it. And so it's hard to say from these verses in detail what was said. But what I want to do this morning is that there is more detail to this verse and in this, this verse is quoted three times in the New Testament. And it's in Romans 4.3, where we're at this morning. It's in James 2.23, which is kind of a different idea of being justified by the works that you're going to perform, which is going to be Romans 6, where we will move. But the other place is Galatians 3.6. And in Galatians 3.6, he's going to help us, and by the Holy Spirit, flush out more of what was going on and what did Abraham believe. And so I want to take a look, if you'll flip over to Galatians 3. Galatians chapter 3, where Robert read this morning. <clears throat> Galatians 3, 6. Even so, Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. I hope that sounds familiar. Familiar. So Galatians, Paul's preached to the people in Galatia, which is Turkey, His first missionary journey was described in Acts 13 through 14. He taught that salvation from sin does not come by keeping the law, but by the work of Christ. The Galatians understood it, believed it, baptized, began to live for Christ. Sometime later, the Jews came to Galatia from Jerusalem. And they come and they start spreading a false teaching. And they said, it's not enough just to believe in Christ. You need Moses as well. And so it's faith plus circumcision. You got to be circumcised to be brought into the people of God. And you got to keep some ritualistic requirements and certain parts of the Mosaic law as well in order to be saved. And Paul said, you add anything to Jesus Christ, let him be anathema. Let him be condemned to judgment. You add anything to Christ plus anything, he's saying anathema, be done. And so Paul's letter then is his response. In the section we're in, he's restating and arguing the gospel. I want you to look with me in Galatians 3.8. The scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. So the Old Testament, it's already foreseeing that God's going to justify us Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to who? He preached the gospel to Abraham. The gospel was preached to him saying this, all the nations will be blessed in you. The nations are going to get blessed by you, your seed, Abraham. And verse 9, so then those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham, the believer. So the ones who will believe what Abraham believed, there's the gospel. You're going to be blessed, whether Jew or Gentile. You'll be sons of Abraham because you have faith. And then jump down to Galatians 3.13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. <clears throat> having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, in order that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. 
And so Abraham, in verse 8, he believed the gospel. Abraham heard the promise of the land and earthly seed, and he believed them. But what gripped his mind and his heart, we're told, is the gospel was preached and the promise of salvation. And I get this in Hebrews 11.10 by the Hall of Fame of Faith. It says that Abraham was looking for the city which has foundations who, whose architect and builder is God. He's not just looking for an earthly land. He knew enough and he was looking for the heavenly Jerusalem whose architect and builder is God. I love what Jesus said in John 8, 56, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he was glad. Abraham looked forward to some work of God and delivering the fallen human race. And I believe that Abraham believed in the coming of Christ specifically. And the reason I say that is in Galatians 3, 16, I want you to catch this. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say, and to seeds, plural, as referring to many, but rather to one, and to your seed, that is Christ. So Abraham, you're going to be blessed through a singular seed. It's said three times in Genesis, singular. And he's saying, Abraham got that. And there's going to be a coming Messiah And all the nations are going to be blessed from a seed that's going to come from you. And that's why Jesus had to be shown to be a son, uh, uh, heir of Abraham. Abraham saw the promise of blessing through a singular descendant of Abraham. And Abraham picked up on this, that it would come through Christ. And so Abraham did not know his name. He, He didn't know all the details of crucifixion and all the things that would come. But he was looking for a coming Messiah that God would bless the nations through. And through the channel of his faith, God declared him a justified person. Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Logizomai, the credit side of the ledger, was righteousness. And I want you to hear this. This, this phrase is, Logizomai is in the aorist. And aorist is kind of like a snapshot in the past here. And so when he believed the righteousness was put to his account. Boom. And it's passive. It isn't something Abraham did. It's what God did. And it's in the indicative, which means a fact. So he he believed God. And there's this one last thing. This little preposition is, is called ace. And if you looked at a little circle, ace means to come right into the middle of it. And so Abraham believed God, and he just plunged into righteousness. A hundred times in the New Testament to be in Christ. And he believes God and he's just plunged into righteousness and it's put to his account and it's just righteousness that there's no height, depth, breadth, or length to this perfect, infinite righteousness of God that is now given to Abraham. And so what has God put together in history is unbelievable to give us a salvation and a singular seed who died in our place and lived the life that we should have. And he was raised in complete victory And anyone who will repent and believe in his name shall be saved. The seed has been colored out in his coming, and we see it so much more beautiful in our day and age than Abraham could ever saw. The one who believes God, though, that Jesus Christ has done this, it will be reckoned to him as righteousness. It will be put to your account this morning as a perfect righteousness to stand blameless before God and accepted and loved. If you've wanted that your whole life, there's a way to stand in the presence of God, loved and accepted. And now I'm going to clarify it with our second point. And we're going to see that in verses four through five. And everybody kind of has their life verses. And Romans four, four through five brought a freedom and a deliverance to me that I, I had become a working one, even as a believer and not realizing it. And so at the end of this, this part, this sermon, we're going to look at the, those who are a working one as an unbeliever, trying to get right with God. And we're going to look at those who are believers and are still being working ones to try to find the love of God and his acceptance. And I've seen it in both groups. And so the where we're going to close this morning is I'm asking God to deliver both groups completely. Verse four. Now to the one who works... His wage is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited 
as righteousness. And so Paul's going to make this clear. In verse 4, it's stated negatively. And in verse 5, it's stated positively. So as we look at verse 4, there's a very simple illustration that he gives us. And he begins with, with a participle. And it's a present tense participle, and it's called a working one. So to the, so the one who, who's a working one, what he gets, he says, is not according to, the Greek word is karin, which is where we get the word charis, which is the beautiful word grace. So, but, but there's a contrast called Allah, but rather, what is his due? So if you're a working one, and, and, and you'll, what you get will never be grace, it'll be what you earned, what you deserve. And so working to earn God's favor and his acceptance and going to church and doing everything you can, obeying your parents and all of that, he's saying, if that's you, you're not going to get the gospel. So the, the example is, of, say I, I hire, I don't know, who wants, who wants Rick Hallahan. Oh, hi, Kai. <laughs> hi and Kai. Sorry, hi. I got gotcha. you. So I'm going to hire Kai. Kai, come to my house. If you work 10 hours in my backyard, I'm going to give you $100. And at the end of the day, man, he, he works hard. Kai is a hard worker. And at the end of the day, I give him his 100 bucks. Is he going to fall at my feet and just go, Pastor, I can't I thank you enough. You're amazing. That's what he earned. In fact, if I don't pay him, he's, he's going to sue me because he's earned it. It's his now. And so just simple. The one who works... His wage is not credited as a favor. It just isn't. It's a debt. And Abraham didn't do this. Abraham didn't put God in a debt by what he did and his works. What does it say? Abraham believed God. It wasn't what he did. And I know without a shadow of a doubt, some of you are sitting here this morning and you're still trying to be a working one. You're trying to work because that's what the church tells you and your flesh tells you and the enemy tells you and you're still trying to work and do all these things so God will like you and approve you and be happy with you. You're stuck in that and you just can't get out of it. And you're, you've been just told, hey, this is what you do as a Christian. You got your 500 thing list and you're working and you can never find peace. You just keep working and I can't get out of this spiral. It's killing me. Come with me to verse 5 this morning, but on the complete opposite. <clears throat> I wish I could just show you my Greek diagram right here. It just screams at you, and I'm going to try my best to show you my diagram. You, you have the exact same participle in both verses. They're both in the present tense. So you got in verse 4, a working one. In verse 5, a working one, but with a little negative particle that says not. So here's the working one, and here's the one who's not working. He's not trying to do something to get God's favor and acceptance. And both of them have the exact same verb. Logizomai in verse 4 and logizomai in verse 5. And in verse 4, logizomai is it's not according to grace. What, what's credited to you is what is due if you're a working one. And in verse 5, it's according to grace and it's what's not due. Guys, this is not what you deserve it's not what you've earned. It's, you're, you're being given grace. You don't deserve this. And so what's before us could be the most important verse in making clear justification by faith in Christ alone. So let's dig in to the one who does not work. Here's a judge giving his verdict. He'll be justified. He's going to be declared not guilty before God, the best sentence that you could ever be given, the best verdict ever, not the working one. And I just, I feel so guilty. I got to do something. I, I got to read my McShane Bible reading so I get through the Bible once a year. I got to pray more. I got to be at church more. And I got to fast and tithe and morally clean up and be a good guy. And I want you to hear this this morning. It comes to the one who doesn't work. I don't know how you could say it any clearer. Let it set in to the one who's not a working one to get the favor of God. You can't bring anything into this courtroom and say, look God, my evidence. There's nothing within you to turn the judge's heart, only his stomach, by what you've done. It's hard to believe, 
because all of our flesh and experience want to do something to get favor with this God. And as this book progresses, I want you to hear Romans 10.3. The Jews, not knowing about, and the Greek is a God kind of righteousness, this gospel. They didn't understand a God kind of righteousness, and they were seeking to establish their own They did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. They looked at law, righteousness of God, and the way you get it is by performing and being a working one. And you get in there and you work. And he says, you missed it. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. The one who believes like Abraham will be credited to your account as righteousness. To the one who's not a working one. Works, have you ever seen those pictures of those guys in a storm where they're in a rowboat and they just are rowing and rowing and they go nowhere and you're just it's driving you crazy. You're watching, go, oh, get them out of the storm. And they just keep rowing and rowing. And as a pastor, I see this constantly. You're just rowing and rowing and you're never at peace. And you're like, where can I serve? What can I do? God, pastor, give me things. I, I'm just not at peace. And I just got to keep rowing and rowing and rowing. I'm a working one. How do, I, how do I keep right with God? And you're just never at peace. You haven't entered into his rest. You're like John Bunyan's, where he's saying it's, you're trying to sweep up your heart and it's a dusty room. And the more you sweep, the dust just keeps coming up and choking you. And I just keep trying to be a better person in the, what the church has called me to be. And I'm just choking on dust. You can't clean your guilt away. Morality and religion and effort will never fix this problem of Genesis 1 through 3. Only the blood of Jesus Christ can cleanse the foulest spot. There's a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Son of God stands up who knows every heart perfectly and knows the depth of your sin more than you ever will. He said, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden with being working ones. And I'll give you rest for your souls. What an offer from God himself. The one who believes in him, he justifies the ungodly in verse 5. And if you got a highlighter, I want you to highlight that word ungodly. And if you don't write in your Bibles, don't write in it. It's one of my favorite words in the Bible. Ungodly. I finally found a box I could fit into. I tried, and I tried, and I tried. And all I ever came up with was ungodly. If God doesn't justify the ungodly, I have no hope. If he only justifies the godly, I'm going to hell. I can't think of a term more fitting. This word just gives me hope. Praise God, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, it's the sick. I didn't come to call the righteous, but the unrighteous. This is the most blessed truth. I don't have to be a working one. I just have to be ungodly and I need to know it and sense Romans 1 through 3 that that was my picture. That was my portrait. That wasn't a picture of my neighbor. That was a picture of me. And I'm ungodly and I have no hope. And I come to him in all of my rags. And by faith, I believe what God has said he will do in Jesus Christ. And it's credited to me as righteousness. He justifies the ungodly. Could, you, could there ever be a better message? <sighs> it just establishes missions and evangelism. And this is it. This is the best message ever. And I don't want any of you to come short of the grace of God this morning. It says his faith is reckoned as righteousness. And the last point I want you to get, it doesn't say his great faith is reckoned as righteousness. It doesn't say his his theologically deep and informed faith is credited as righteousness. It could be the size of a mustard seed. It could be a child. A little two-year-old that looks and believes. And by grace, this will be put to your account, the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. And you're like that little 
Gentile lady who said, Jesus, just give me a crumb from your table of mercy and it will be enough. All I need to do is just glance at Christ. It doesn't matter how, if you've got double vision, you know, cataracts, it, all I do is I look at this Christ and believe and it will be reckoned to you as righteousness. And now God the Father looks on me the same way he looked upon his own son. This is my beloved son or daughter in who I am well pleased. And now he loves me because I'm in Christ to the same degree he loves Christ. So it's not your fruit. It's not your goodness, your love. It's your faith. And I don't know how to say it any clearer. It's finished. Tetelestai. And the one who believes that righteousness will be put to your account. And so I close with the unbeliever who's still trying to clean up your life and be a better person, go to church. This morning I'm asking you to quit being a working one. And I want you to believe what God has said is true in Jesus Christ. And, and God wrote this, that Abraham was justified when he believed, so that this morning, if you would believe, you likewise would be justified by God and declared not guilty and accepted in his presence. And I pray for any believer who did what I did. And I slowly was just trying to change my life and I wanted lordship and I just wanted him to have every bit of my life and I just kept trying. I remember I used to get up at four in the morning and, and read Psalms for three hours saying, God, don't let my mind drift in worship this morning. And I'd come in here and my mind would drift in worship again and again. And I just so badly wanted to please God and I couldn't enter into rest because I just felt like I, I wasn't doing enough. And, and I had it all backwards. I thought that if I did enough, I could rest in Christ. And this Bible says you rest in Christ and he'll begin to let fruit flow out of your life that you could have only hoped or dreamed. And so I'm praying that every one of us, if you're a working one this morning and you are sitting here in guilt and shame that I just can't do enough, I want you to lift your eyes again by faith and believe this gospel and to know that it will be reckoned, it's been reckoned to you as righteousness and that I'm accepted right now as, as perfectly as I will be if I did a million good works. I'm only accepted by the works that Jesus Christ did. And that's our foundation of sanctification and holiness that we will journey. But if you don't have this foundation, you will always become a working one and you'll put yourself back under a yoke of slavery and you'll bring yourself under the law again, trying to get God's approval by what you do. And I'm telling you, I've watched this for 30 years. It doesn't work. And I'm, I'm, I want you to be set free in the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ as believers. <laughs> to quit trying that. And, and you know what I love about the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience. He gives the whole list. And he says, against such things, there is no law. And we all come to the fruit of the Spirit, and it's our new Ten Commandments. And I'm going to work at having more joy. I just need to be more joyful. I need self-control. And you just start working at it. And the whole thing is it's a fruit. There is no law to produce it. You can't go create it. It's going to come out of faith in this gospel and the fruit of abiding in Christ. And it's going to begin to come out of you as you believe what I'm talking about. And you're going to begin to be filled with love because you know God loves you. And you're going to be full of joy because there's a God who loves me and I have peace with God. And I'm patient now because I have everything in Christ. And the one who believes this, the fruit is going to be abundant. But the one who looks at the, the, the new Ten Commandments, you're going to just keep being a working one and you're never going to become what Jesus Christ has saved us for. So all that's for free. Any questions? Abraham believed God. And it was credited to him as righteousness. And that was written not only for him, but for us this morning who will believe. Best news I've ever heard. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this glorious, sweet, wonderful gospel. I thank you that it's always been by grace through faith. Lord, everyone either looked at those sacrifices and knew that one was coming. Abraham knew a singular seed was going to come and save the nations. God, we, they, they believed you at your word, that you would send one who would crush the serpent's head. 
And so I thank you throughout history that it's been those that you gave eyes to see and believed. And you justified them. And God, we thank you that even now, those of us sitting here who will believe you, that you will justify us by the work of Jesus Christ, that we could be declared not guilty and have perfect righteousness in our account. And next week, all of our sins put to another's account. Oh God, thank you for grace. We have nothing to boast in, but the grace of Almighty God through Jesus Christ. We worship you this morning. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen.